how do you find purpose? What does it mean to live with intention? And why is it so important to cultivate stillness? These questions are important, the answers are elusive, and they can only be found by essentially knowing where to look. Well, knowing where to look also happens to be the title of the new book by today's guest, Light Watkins, dropping in today for his third appearance on the show. Light, in addition to being a good friend and a beautiful incarnation of the human form, a nomadic minimalist, is and has been for the last 20 years, a lauded meditation and spiritual teacher. He's also a prolific public speaker, the founder of something called The Shine, which is this really groovy event series, think Ted meets self-realization, and the author of three books, The Inner Gym, Bliss More, and of course, his latest, Knowing Where to Look. It's a great talk about stuff that matters. I think you'll enjoy it. So hit that subscribe button and that notification bell thing. And as for knowing where to look, you're in the right place. So without further ado, please enjoy me and my friend, Light Watkins. Good to see you, my friend. It's been a while. I know. I can't remember the last time we crossed paths, maybe a couple of years. Yeah, I think I saw you actually on your birthday at Cafe Gratitude. Yes. Um, when you turn 50, I believe. 50? How old are you now? Dude, I'm almost 55. Couldn't oh, have been that so no, long you ago. Were, yeah, you turned Maybe like 53 it was, or something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. yeah. It was a I remember years that. Ago. I remember that. Pre pandemic, yeah. Cafe Gratitude. You were wearing all black, a bunch of beads, <laughs> hair was longer, yeah. no beard. A lot so more hair. That helps to narrow down the time that's yeah. around when it was. And you're with, you're with Julie and. and uh, I think it was just you and her. I think it was just, or maybe the maybe, kids. Maybe one of the kids or, mm. I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, pre-pandemic though. Yeah. You've had an interesting- I was uh, already like on the road at that time. Right. So I happened to be back in LA just randomly. Right, so you've spent the last year, well, initially you were in Atlanta, right? Before going to Mexico City? Yes. Or did you go back and forth? I was started off the pandemic in Atlanta, then LA, and then back to Atlanta, and then back to LA and then Mexico City. So I was actually in each of those places for like about four or five months. Mm. There was a little bit of a LA exodus to Mexico City. Yeah. I have like three or four friends yeah. who, who kind of have been riding out the pandemic down there. Yeah, it's a great place to ride it out. How did you decide on Mexico City? I had been hearing about it for years. And then when I went nomadic in 2018, I started going to Mexico City here and there for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. three weeks. And it's like, it's kind of like being in Europe without going to Europe because mm -hmm. you're still in central time zone uh, in the US. And, uh, and it's just beautiful, you know, it's just everything, it's green, it's very walkable. The food scene, the cafe scene is amazing. Yeah. The service is impeccable, like everything is great and the dollar goes a long way. Right, it's affordable. Yeah. Well, I'm fascinated by this nomadic lifestyle that you've, you've been pursuing. Mm. I, I suppose, I guess this is part, it, it was kicked off by kind of the third purge that you've done. Cause yeah. this is not the first no. time that you've <laughs> explored this. <laughs> um, and I, it, there's a part of me that's, that's jealous, like what it would feel like to just be that free mm. to live out of, literally, you know, a carry on mm -hmm. and be that kind of malleable and mobile. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I'm in a, normally when you hear that sort of story, you, you probably imagine someone in their twenties, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe in their early thirties at the latest. Right. Meanwhile, I'm about to be 50. So, <laughs> so it's a little uh -huh. different in that, in this life stage, because People, my, my peers are all like, they're really establishing serious roots. Some of them are even grandparents at this point mm -hmm. or kids out of college. And so there's not a lot of people who I grew up with who can really relate to what I'm doing. So you really have to be, you know, sure of yourself and, yeah. and, uh, and into the idea of it. And that's, I've kind of been that way my whole life. So I don't really know any different, but yeah, it's been an interesting journey and, um, and I tell people who are f intrigued by it, I was like, look, you know, I'm not, my example is not to go and sell off all your stuff and, you know, jump on an airplane overnight. Like it took years of experimenting mm -hmm. to get to this point. And, um, and so 
for me, it just kind of felt like a natural extension of what I was already kind of doing. I mean, mm-hmm. I was already prior to 2018, I was traveling. I was going to London every month or so. I was going to New York all the time. So I started challenging myself to see if I could live off of whatever I could fit into my carry-on bag for those two weeks or three weeks I was gonna be on the road. And then, and then after doing that for a couple of years, then it was like, okay, well, I know I can do it. Yeah. You know, I've practiced it enough. Let me go ahead and sell all this other stuff and just commit to it. But there's a difference between knowing you can do it and reckoning with whether it's the right thing to do. I mm-hmm. suspect you must come up against moments of, of loneliness or self-doubt with this. 100%, I mean, you know, you spend a lot of time on your own, but then that's where the meditation and all right. the inner work kind of kicks in. You know, I've been uh-huh. doing that for 20 years and I try to tell people, you know, un- help people understand that that's been a part of my journey as well. And one of the primary benefits of all that daily meditation is you you become more self-aware, you become more uh, comfortable with your own company, mm-hmm. you enjoy silence and, you know, and I can be as, you have to also be relatively outgoing if you wanna if you wanna find a social life right. in these different places. So I mean, you know, I can kind of dip in as much as I want to, and I'm I consider myself to be more of a introverted ex, extrovert. Like I can do the extroverted thing here and there mm-hmm. if I want to, but I'm very comfortable with my own company as well. So and I'm I'm busy, you know, I'm writing books and I'm yeah. I've got a podcast and. I'm teaching meditation trainings and organizing retreats. So it's like, I almost spend a lot of time. It's kind of like when you and I first met at that hotel, the Ace Hotel in the Mm -hmm. Flatiron District in New York, you were, this was midnight. I was there doing some work and you were there doing work. I know. (laughs) You know, and I was on the road teaching, but, but after hours, I was like writing my, my book, or I would think I was marketing my first book, uh, The Inner Gym. Mm -hmm. And you were there. Uh, editing a episode. Yeah, I think I was getting writing a, an getting intro a podcast or something like up that. or something like yeah. I was in search of internet. And that's kind of my life is, right. you know, I'm so passionate about the things that I do that I, I just kind of busy myself very easily. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we've had conversations about that. Like there's no such thing as work-life balance when you're really passionate about what you do. So Yeah, it's so deeply integrated. Well, there's a difference between uh, getting rid of all your stuff and going on some kind of walkabout versus living your life intentionally, being clear on what it is that you're doing, what you're seeking and being purposeful in you know, how you kind of approach that very different type of lifestyle. Yeah, and I, I consider myself to be one of the lucky ones to have kind of centered in on a mission that I'm very, very excited about. Like I literally wake up in the morning and I can't wait to get to work and thinking about ideas and spitballing and on my own, when I'm just walking around and so mm-hmm. every every, spare moment is really an opportunity to kind of tweak and refine. And then you add social media to it, right? And then it's like, okay, well, I would love to put some kind of messaging out there to, you know, I wanna yeah. get this I, this quote in my head. It's like, oh, I gotta tweak the quote and then I gotta turn it into a quote card on Instagram and then an audiogram, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. like hours Are you doing all that yourself? I'm doing all that myself. Wow. Yeah, I wow. do it all of myself. I mean, I, the idea is not to continue doing it all myself all the time, mm-hmm. but. It's kind of how I iterate. Like I have to get my hands dirty. I have to roll up my sleeves and uh, and see how things work. Mm-hmm. And I'll get so many more ideas of how to communicate more efficiently and optimize the the process just for myself from just doing it myself. And then mm-hmm. eventually I can explain it simply to someone to help me. And, right. and that's kind of how that right. works. Yeah, through the doing, you you know see the path. You know the path is revealed ahead of you, which is a big kind of message in the book. Yeah, and it's all storytelling, right? And that's really what people connect with the most mm-hmm. is whether it's an Instagram caption, or a tweet, or an, a daily dose of inspiration email that I send out. It's all stories, and and it help every time I sit down and especially when you have limitations. Like I was telling a friend of mine, he said, your, your daily doses, you know, these emails that you send out every day, they've gotten shorter and shorter. And I said, well, yeah, because now I want people to be able to like screenshot them and share them a lot easier. So I intentionally keep them within a hundred or 125 words mm-hmm. if possible. Sometimes it's not possible, but I also followed up with, it's harder to write a short 
email much harder than it yeah, is yeah. to just let my yeah. you know thoughts rip <laughs> and just not edit it as much. So it actually takes longer to truncate it and keep it succinct, and also to put it through all the screens that you're very familiar with. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's like you put out some really heartfelt, vulnerable post about your journey, and then you get the one like person commenting about how you didn't include their little situation or right. overlooked. And it's like, no, he probably thought about that. I'm sure he thought about it five levels deeper than anyone who's commenting on his post, but you can't accommodate for every little exceptional of not. situation. Yeah, you know? brevity is not my strength though. Yeah. You know, the, the economy of your lifestyle in some part perhaps fuels your economy of language. You know, everything is being kind of, it's like the the path gets narrower, and when you, you know, read the words of the sages and the Buddhas, it's always very short. Mm. Like there's a clarity in that that mm-hmm. comes through decades of wisdom acquired through experience. Yeah, I mean that's one of my mantras: is if you can't, it's the Einstein quote: if you can't explain it simply, then you don't know it well enough. Right, and so, and that's why I've really come to embrace reminders because, and reading things over, the same things over and over and over, because you just, you see them differently each time and then you're mm-hmm. understanding them at a deeper level. And then it be, gets distilled down to its essence. And that's really where, where it's, it becomes, you know, almost magical yeah. in that, in its application and utility. I feel like, like, uh, like that, that uh, you're taking advantage of these very powerful tools that are available to us that allow us to uncouple geographic location from vocation in past decades to kind of you know live the minimalist lifestyle and be a nomad would be you know akin to kung fu you know kind of wandering into towns and there is an asceticism that's built into it but you're still able to do all the things that you would be doing if you owned a home with a picket fence and had you know a, a car in the driveway. Yeah, and and in a way, I do still have those things. I just don't own them myself. I'm just uh-huh. using other people's. Right. So, so where are you? Where, where are you staying now? Um, I'm staying in in in, um, in Mexico City. I'm I just have an Airbnb. That uh-huh. I it's like a beautiful two bedroom, just like I had a two bedroom in L.A. So I think people have this idea that I'd like to. I'm, drawn to tiny houses and it's like, no, I actually yeah. like space and I like things. <laughs> I just don't need to own them myself. <laughs> right. And uh, unfortunately you don't need a car in, in Mexico city. Um, and I'm just, I don't even know how long I'll be there, but everywhere I go, when I'm in London, I'll rent an Airbnb somewhere mm-hmm. or um, you know, New York, what, what have you. And I kind of, prefer places where you don't need to be driving so much. Mm-hmm. So, but in Los Angeles, I'd stay with a buddy of mine who's got a beautiful place and I rent a car and so, you know, I make it work. Right. You're able to be in the modern world. Yeah, 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 yeah. very much. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're the not only thing that's adorned different. in robes walking barefoot no. down Abikini. And also, you know, I'm on, I'm on stage and I'm speaking, right. and I'm, you know, so it's like, I, I can't look like I'm living out of a backpack. I want it to look like you don't even know that I'm living out of a backpack. Mm-hmm. That's just, that's something that's happening in the background. And, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it does help me uh, practice brevity in all areas of life. Cause you just, you have to, you know, you, you, you and, and people always want to like give me things, which I think is very, very sweet. And I have to remind them, I said, look, it's nice that you want to give me this little token or this little thing or book or whatever, but it's like, I really don't have any room for it. I mean, right. You can imagine how many people give you just this little thing and it sure. adds up. So, um, so yeah, I have But to. it's not personal if you have this general rule. No, it's not. But I, I imagine it must've been hard. You've talked about this a little bit um, when it came to, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this thing again. I'm going to shed and you're getting rid of like all your journals mm-hmm. and all these kind of very personable memorabilia that mm-hmm. were kind of hardwired to collect. Mm-hmm. Um, there must be a sense that, you know, once you've done that, like a, a, a feeling of, of lightness, but um, do you ever think like, oh, I wish I hadn't, like those are things that when I'm old, I'd like to look at that maybe could have provided the foundation for the next book or, or are they all scanned and in the cloud? So I you still have them. I scan everything in the clouds. Okay. I scan every uh-huh. page of every journal. So I have everything. And that's what's great about 
modern technology is that mm-hmm. we can do that. And you know, and in a way it's even more accessible now because now I can categorize it, I can label it all mm-hmm. and it's all in my, my, um, my file storage application. So I can just go to it in a couple minutes and I can, and I've, I've actually looked at those things a lot more than I ever did when it was just collecting right. dust in the back of my yeah, closet. So, you know, I think that's something that people should do anyway is scan all of their stuff in so that they can at least access it whenever right. they're with somebody from their past. And they're like, oh, wow, you know, I have you these photos of right us up. from like 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to go and dig for it and wonder where it is and which box you put it in and this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So that became, and also I kind of worked the, the, the logic on it. And I said, look, when someone writes a memoir or when someone, or when someone dies, mm-hmm. Right, so even someone prolific like a Steve Jobs, right, the guy who created the iPhone when he dies, how many photos of Steve Jobs have we seen floating around out there? Probably a dozen, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe a couple more than that. But you can imagine he probably had a kajillion photos somewhere, but yeah. we only see like a dozen, and you can apply that to really anybody, right? So the point is if this stuff is going to become used at some point later, you don't need that many. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you right, don't need right, your right. whole catalog of, yeah. cause no one's How apparently, you actually no one's need? gonna sift through all of that I stuff. Know. And, but, uh, but if you have kids, then you just start hoarding like crazy, crazy numbers of photos. Yeah, or you just, you but know. if you have kids, you know, in 20, 30 years from now, and they wanna, they wanna see old pictures and it's all categorized and they have the passwords and everything mm-hmm. to your files, then, they can see everything a lot more efficiently than sure. like digging through and wondering what is this, where sure. is this from, you know. So it's kind of a way to to organize it a little bit better. Yeah. Well, even though we haven't seen each other in a while, uh, I've been paying attention to kind of everything that you've been doing over the last year when the pandemic hit and there was this social permission for everybody to just kind of stop and stay at home and and do nothing and not feel guilty about it. I feel like you've been incredibly productive and in many ways really found your voice like in a new gear with all the stuff that you start putting out those videos mm-hmm. um, on Instagram, which were, are continue to be like so well thought out. And every time I look at them, I'm like, is he reading off a script? Is he just, <laughs> is he just spontaneously <laughs> like delivering these incredible monologues that are so clear and, and concise in yeah. their point of view and, and thinking? Yeah, I've been pretty open about the fact that those were all written out and uh-huh. rehearsed. And, um, you know, I, again, I wanted to keep them within like a minute, maybe a couple right. of minutes at the most, but really it was just to, value people's time because I know that when I just speak off the top of my head, I have a tendency to drag on and on and on. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I want it to be as concise and as clear as possible. And and so I would, my process was I would, you know, I, what you're referring to is I, I made a vow to myself when I was in Mexico city in February 14th, 2000 and, um, 20, right at, the, right at the very beginning, I made a vow to myself to post a video a day on Instagram. And the reason was because I wanted to practice speaking on camera. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'd been already writing my daily dose of inspiration emails and sending those out for four years. So I had already been used to, to generating inspirational content because that's what happens when you do something every day yeah. is you start to, it starts coming through you. And so now I was just kind of applying it to video form, but I didn't want to, sometimes I would borrow ideas of things I'd already written. Sometimes it would just be things that came through me and I would speak on that. Um, And so it wasn't really about, you know, anything more than just practicing. Mm -hmm. And, And then come April, May, when the George Floyd thing happened, it was literally just another day and I, I thought to myself, okay, what am I gonna speak on today? I'm literally sitting on my couch in my Airbnb in Atlanta and I wanted to go to the park and go for a run, but I, I hadn't shot my video yet. And it usually is like an hour and a half, maybe mm-hmm. two hour long process, depending on how clear my thoughts are. 
And, uh, and I was doing everything myself. I had learned how to caption, how to put headlines, how to do all, it takes like, the process was like three or four apps before we posted. Right. it. And I thought, you know, this thing that happened to George Floyd, people probably exclude me from that category of person. Like I, obviously I'm, I'm a black person, but a lot of my, my non-black friends, I think see me in a different way than they would look mm-hmm. at someone like George Floyd. And I said, this is a great opportunity to, to communicate that actually the things that happened to him have also happened to me, maybe not as extreme at this point in time, but it could go in that direction if I'm mm-hmm. in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong cop and all of that. And so I spoke to that, you know, cause I'm from Alabama and a part of being from Alabama, which is the, which was the staging point of the modern civil rights movement. You know, that, that's a part of the ongoing conversation in all black families is uh, black people, white people, this happened to us and mm-hmm. this is what we have to do and you have to work harder and all these kinds of things. So I just talked about a few instances where I had been racially profiled in my life all the way up until most recently, you know, when I was, when I was marketing my last book, Bliss More, the meditation book, I had been pulled over by a cop in LA um, because the cop had received a call that I was looking to break into someone's car. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm going to a book interview, <laughs> to, right. to a podcast. <laughs> oh interview. my God. <laughs> but some person saw me and um, I was looking for my friend's parking space. She said, you can park your scooter behind my car. So there are all these numbered parking spaces. And I'm, I'm like, I can't find the parking space. And so somebody thought I was like, uh, like casing the, casing casing the whole the cars, parking lot right. to find out whose car I was gonna break into. I'm on a scooter, mm-hmm. meanwhile, right. like, I don't know where I'm gonna, yeah. what I'm gonna carry but on the scooter. you're a scary black man. <laughs> but I'm a scary black yeah. man. I had a suit coat on and everything. So anyway, those kinds of things have been happening. And it's almost up until that point, it was unremarkable. Like, you know, who am I gonna complain about it to or that's gonna really care or is not gonna say, oh, you know, that was just coincidence, but it happens all the time, not mm-hmm. all the time, but it happens often enough that to my black friends, it's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, to my white friends, it's like, well, you know, okay. Mm-hmm. And so I talked about those instances starting when I was like seven or eight years old, all the way up until that point. And that video, you know, normally I would post a video, get maybe a few thousand views. That video got 3.5 million views. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. Yeah, I guess people want to hear more about this. <laughs> well, I remember seeing that video and then watching your daily videos and and just getting this sense that you, because you are this guy who you're the meditation mindfulness guy, yeah, and and you really exist predominantly in a, in in a, in kind of this this white wellness culture. You know, that's where you've made your mark and what you're known for, um, but in the wake of George Floyd, you really stepped up and met the moment in a meaningful way. And it's not a surprise to me that those videos, you know, have traveled in the way that they have. And your demeanor in speaking about it is, you know, I think a product of the decades of meditation that you have, you're able to speak about these things with a, with a, um, a degree of equanimity and, and objectivity while making your point but in a manner that is digestible to a, a you know a large audience i think is that fair yeah i realized i was actually uniquely qualified to speak on it because i'm black so i have that experience mm-hmm. but then also like you said with the meditation and the wellness stuff like i almost had like a a way to kind of speak on it from a 10,000 foot perspective instead of the ground level perspective mm-hmm. where everyone's like heated and emotional. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and there's a time and place for that, obviously. And I think it was also important to just relate to it from a little bit further out and show, oh, you know, there are some connections here in a way that the people who follow me, which is prim- primarily white people, Right, because that's who I was really speaking to. I wasn't speaking mm-hmm. to black people because sure. black people don't need to be yeah, they, they, they told they, about they they, you know, yeah. racism and all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I got you know you get a lot of comments like, "Oh, I've never thought about it like that." Oh, wow, you know, I need to go and have a conversation. And it's like, well, no, this is how you have the conversation because otherwise, you're gonna 
Mm-hmm. You're gonna reject. Uh, you're gonna d- have people be defensive and whatnot. So yeah, it was it was a, it was an interesting time, and I felt very. It felt very organic for me. It was almost like you know, if the world wanted to talk about ultra marathons, and it's like, whoa, yeah, <laughs> it's suddenly and, and, and recovery, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, Rich yeah, has yeah. a lot to say about yeah. that. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I applaud it. You know, it, it was, it was, in, it was like, oh, he's really, he's, he's stepping up to own a space. He must be feeling on some level like he's getting out of his comfort zone but it was so clearly not just the right thing to do, but the right thing for you to do. Mm. Like it felt like you were very comfortable doing that, doing yeah. it, even though it departed from kind of the way you normally operate. I mean, I remember one video you made it was called something like for, for white people asking what to do about mm-hmm, racism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I watched that and I think about that video all the time. And, mm. and, and I would have to tell you that, that you know, I credit that video and other videos that you've made with how I started to, you know, rethink how I'm approaching the moment. And that was a big, that was a big motivator in, in our decision to go to Minneapolis the other mm-hmm. week and, and have those conversations that we've had. Um, so, you know, if you ever questioned <laughs> the, the efficacy or the, you know, the effect of, of what you're doing, like I, I can tell you that I'm personally grateful for it. Thank you, man. Yeah, it was interesting because I also, I didn't want to, you know, once you go viral with something, it's obviously tempting to kind of feed into that. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, I could, you know, like my whole follower count doubled and everything. And and so, but I didn't, I, I had to consciously choose to, continually being organic with it and not right. try to force, you know, these topics because I knew that they would be very popular. Mm-hmm. I wanted to cuz that I think that's one of the reasons why it resonated initially is because I wasn't trying to become popular. I wasn't trying to go viral. I was just speaking openly and, and authentically and so it was just a, it was a really interesting opportunity to kind of go back within. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and still maintain that level of what I felt was authenticity throughout the whole process. And I'm honestly, I'm kind of, it was nice to get back to talking about things that weren't necessarily directly tied into mm-hmm. all of that. Because again, that's been an ongoing conversation in my consciousness for as long as I've been on the planet. And it ultimately, it, it's not my issue to solve, you know, or even to give all this perspective to, I think ultimately it's it's something that needs to be worked out with white people, Yeah. right? And I'm happy to kind of give the impetus for that conversation to take place. But what would make me really happy is to see more white people just having, initiating that conversation mm-hmm. with other white people and mm-hmm. just kind of talking about it. And, 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 and um, and hopefully, you know, getting other people to talk about it and just having the conversation more and more and more. Cause I kind of started feeling like a broken record after a little yeah. while. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think those conversations are happening. I think more white people are are engaging in that in a, in a in a more meaningful way than they have historically. I think a lot of white people feel paralyzed. Um, they're so terrified of getting it wrong that mm-hmm. it prevents the conversation from even happening. And there's a permissiveness to the way that you kind of speak about it that provides that that kind of opening, I think that allows people to feel a little bit more comfortable engaging in it, knowing you're not gonna get it right or being okay with misstepping as long as, you know, in good faith, you're, you're, you're grappling with it in, in, in a way that, you know, perhaps could have some kind of impact. Yeah. I don't know, man. What's your sense of all of it now? I mean, it's been a year. We just we came back from Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago, you know. I, and part of that, you know, even if the trial wasn't going on, like I, it was something I wanted to do, because there's this sense, like, oh, well, well, we did the George Floyd thing. Like mm-hmm. now we're past that, and like mm-hmm. now we're we're good, right? And it's like, no, this is this is something that's going to take a very long time. Like we have to keep having it. Um, but at the same time, are we belaboring it? Are we sounding like a broken record? Like finding that balance, I think also. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's the shift that ultimately needs to happen. I would, I'm not, I can't speak for all black people, but I will speak from my own experience. It's like, I don't like having, like I'm like anybody else. Like I have a book 
is coming out. It's about inspiration. I yeah. have other things that I'm excited about. Yeah. And every time the police or there's some situation that occurs, right? It's almost like as a black person, you have to stop and you know start talking about that and mm-hmm. say her name and you know all these kinds of things. And it's like white people have the option to do it. They don't have to do it. They can do it if they want to. But ultimately, you know, as a black creator, you kind of have to at least acknowledge it in all. So it's like you have to figure out ways to thread in police mm-hmm. brutality with talking about right. the art of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, well, you did it in the book. I mean, you tell the story yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you and your brother as kids and, yeah. and, and the, the sort of legacy of that and how these experiences recur over the course of your lifetime. And you just learn to assimilate you know, to that reality on some level, but that this is nothing unique. You know, anybody who's living the black experience knows this well. Yeah. And, and you know, that's just part of what you do as a black person. Right. So, but you'd like to see it with other people as well. You'd like to see mm-hmm. people take it as seriously when when it happens you know to anyone mm-hmm. and but you know it's a big world people have a lot going on and and um so it's just it's going to take time yeah. i guess but yeah. we have to keep talking about it so i'm glad we're yeah we're, we've talked no, about I'm, it here I'm, on this I'm, podcast i'm glad to i'm glad to talk about it with you i'll talk about it as much as you like but we also yeah. want to talk about we want to talk yeah, about yeah, the yeah. book right let's do it um knowing where to look you did an extraordinary job with this book i love it it's beautiful um, it's as much, you know, an art book as it is a book book. It is a bit of a choose your adventure type mm-hmm. thing. You can crack it open to, to any page. And it's one of those things where like, oh, I didn't know that this is what I needed today, but this mm-hmm. is exactly what I needed to hear. Um, the, the artistry behind it is very cool. Uh, as you said, there's, there's like Easter eggs in here and mm-hmm. the layout, you know, is, is what you've done with like font and typeset and all of that and graphic design all kind of feeds the themes that you're trying to express. And it's all, uh, you know, oriented around these 108, essentially like anecdotes, lessons, stories. Um, And 108, of course, being this spiritually relevant number that permeates Hinduism and Buddhism and is this, you know, uh, metaphor for, you know, unity and wholeness and any number of other mystical factors that Mm -hmm. apply to that specific number, including the number of beads on any mala that you, you know, drape around your neck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, initially, you know, obviously there was a conversation around 365, one a day, Mm -hmm. but I didn't want the experience to have a linear, even an accidentally linear, approach mm-hmm. i wanted i really wanted people to to feel like they could just start anywhere and even if they needed to revisit the same one it's almost like one of those magic eight balls that you yeah. you know from when we were younger where you shake it up and it's got that little blue liquid and then the answer to whatever your question was would come into the yeah. the little uh viewer and so i wanted it to have that kind of feeling and and and, and level of engagement with people and uh and I feel like we've we've succeeded in that. We painstakingly went over every single de- like. There's literally no detail in mm. any of those pages that we didn't mm-hmm. at least spend a few hours going over and talking about how we can really uh, bring the meaning through the design and the way the text is shaped and all of that. So so I want it to be like this little adventure that people may not discover what's hidden in there until they re- read it two or three times mm-hmm. or, or more. Mm-hmm. And it is, you know, it, it is it, it is about brevity too. Like it's not, you know, they're they're simple stories, but they're powerful lessons. It's a book about, you know, all kinds of things: kindness, patience, mm-hmm. relationships, reflection, relationships, gratitude, commitment. trust, faith. Everything we struggle small with. Small gestures, yeah, compassion. Everything, yeah. everything we struggle with on a daily, uh-huh. daily, moment to moment basis. Almost right. anything you're conflicted with right now, if you crack the book open, you can probably find. And I tell people, this is not about giving you the answer. It's just a little nudge Mm -hmm. to maybe look in this direction or look Mm -hmm. behind you. And that's where you'll find your own answer, your own solution within yourself. If there is a a meta arc or theme to it though, it's in my mind, a book about inspiration and courage. Mm -hmm. You know, the opening of the book with this story about 
uh, your decision to go to Paris. I mean, that's an amazing story. Mm. How how you know the universe conspired to support you at just the right time, and it's sort of faith and courage in motion. And having that level of of conviction about that at a young age, I think, is interesting and 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 kind of foreshadowed the life to come, even if you were not consciously aware of how it would play out. Yeah, I wasn't consciously aware of it, but obviously in hindsight, I, I feel very fortunate to have had that kind of experience in a, such an obvious way. So what you're referring to is I was, um, when I graduated college, I had a nine to five job for a few months, realized right off the bat, this is not really mm-hmm. for me or it's gonna be here later. So I may as well, you know, do something else, see the world, exercise freedom. And I had this calling to go to Paris and um, and it, there was nothing really more to it than that. And I, I spent my last little money on a one-way ticket to Paris, not really knowing anyone there, not speaking the language, just really a le- the leap of faith in every sense of that phrase and uh, landed in Paris and ended up after on the first day, ended up running into some friends of mine from college who Well, then, let's just hold on. I'm gonna interrupt you. And yeah. like, we gotta back up a little bit okay. there's, cause there's two things that immediately pop into my head that I wanna know more about. And the first is the, the impulse, the germinating impulse to even do it in the first place. Like what was the, you know, conscious awareness around that? Like it was this knowing, like you just had to do this thing you knew on paper, it was kind of insane. Like you didn't even wanna tell your mom what you were doing. You told her you had a job in Paris, but you had this compulsion that you couldn't ignore Mm -hmm. that motivated this whole thing. Yeah, it was a thought that would not go away. And now I realize that whenever you have a thought that feels charming to your heart and it doesn't go away, that's an indication from the universe, in quotes, the universe, Mm Uh, to move in that direction. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily meant to fulfill that completely, but just take a step or two in that direction. And then the next instructions will come to you once you start moving in that direction. Sure, it's, it's one thing to have that sense and it's another thing to trust it or yes. to take action on it especially as a young person who's mm-hmm. got all this social programming around, like you gotta get the job and here's what you do and this is how it's gonna play out. So there's something about you that I think is unique in your, your ability at that young age to, to have that cognizance, to be able to recognize that as the opportunity that you needed to follow. Well, there was some fear there too, you know, like I wasn't all courageous and like, uh-huh. you know, like I definitely was skeptical. I definitely had doubts. I definitely um, didn't know what was gonna happen, um, but I had been testing the waters with, with following that voice for a few years prior mm-hmm. to that, even in, in university. I remember I was, I had been awarded, I applied for and campaigned for this job as the editor of the yearbook in college, mm-hmm. which was a very uh, prominent position because you got paid and you got a great parking space at Howard University in uh-huh. Washington, DC. And, um, and I did that at my junior year and so, the expectation is once you do it and now you've already had the experience under your belt, of course you're gonna do it your senior year. Why wouldn't you, right? Right. But I decided something told me not to do it and instead to go and explore like working on Capitol Hill and doing these other things, taking photography classes mm-hmm. and all this other stuff. So I listened to it and it was great, you know? And I don't know what I missed out on from not doing it, but you know, those kinds of decisions mm-hmm. I had been making just kind of, and I guess a part of that was not identifying success with money or with prominence or with titles, right? And I, I, I feel like I consciously um, had been questioning all of that for a long time. And so when it came up again after college and I was at that job, you know, I decided to leave the job because I didn't equate my success with Right. You know, of rising up through the ranks of that 
advertising agency. And so it was just kind of an extension of all of that if I'm mm-hmm. looking back at it now. But you know, I like to speak about these things in ways that help other people access the same kind of thing. And I wasn't meditating or I wasn't doing, this is, we're talking in the mid nineties now. Yeah. So there's none of that happening. But I do remember intentionally um, just testing the waters and questioning, you know, if this is really making me happy or if this path is going to lead to some sense of fulfillment within. Mm -hmm. And so on paper, or if you pull the lens back on my life at that time, it looks like I was kind of all over the place. You know, I was trying this and trying that. And, but really I was just trying to taste different colors of life to find, okay, what's the path for me? Uh And it happened to be taking me to Europe for a period. So you go to the airport, you got like a couple hundred bucks, right? That's it. Yeah, nothing. And a backpack. Um, And, and the, the flight's oversold. So they start doing an auction, you know, who's gonna give up their seat. The auction ratchets up to 400 bucks or whatever it is. And you opt for that. So before you've even left, you already have taken care of your return ticket. Yeah, I got tw- two of yeah. those in two days in a row. So you know, another signal from the universe. Okay, yeah. this might work out. Yeah. You go to, and you meet, you meet people on the airplane or no, in the airport? Because in the, in the, in the hotel. Right, in the hotel before you left, right. Who they were in gave the same up their boat. seats as well. So you already know people who are going to Paris who are Americans before you even go. So you have some kind of you know grounding foundation. You go to Paris, you interview for a job you don't get, but down the hall is like your college friend that mm-hmm. you didn't even know lived in Paris. There's like all of these crazy. Well, this, fr- this guy looked at me in that first office and says, you know, what happened with you in this job? And I said, I didn't get it. And he said, he, he, was, he was American, he was from didn't Chicago. He, he said, I, I, I've, he recognized I've met you me from Chicago. Right, yeah. He recognized my photo from, from I, some modeling yeah, thing. Yeah, from some did? modeling uh-huh. thing I did. He recognized me. He happened mm-hmm. to live in Paris and he right. was from Chicago and he was in the office that day, that morning. And the first place I went once I landed, and I told him, oh, I got rejected. And he said, follow me. And he took me out of that office on the same floor of the same building down to the next office right next to it. And we walked in and then we saw my friend from college who turned around and goes, oh my God, what are you doing here? And he didn't know that she knew no, you. Right? No, he didn't so, know she so was in it's there. It's like bananas, right? She just happened to be there. Yeah. She wasn't working <laughs> yeah. in there. She just happened to be there right. with her friend who happened to have a spare apartment because his mom had just left town. Uh-huh to go visit his sister. And he said, where are you? they said, where are you staying? I said, I don't have a place yet. I literally didn't have- It was have, the same day that you arrived. It was the same morning. It was within two hours of arriving. That's that's. And crazy. I had an apartment, yeah. I had friends. I had two uh, vouchers for $400 for a flight. <laughs> right. I had a, a I mean, that's a powerful occupation. lesson. You're like, okay. I like, had everything. This trust in the universe thing, you know, if this you trust. do it right, maybe, you know, this is this is the way. Yeah, and that's the whole through line of the book is really, to follow your heart, mm-hmm. take the leap of faith, which is where the courage part comes in because it mm-hmm. requires, it's not about getting rid of the fear, it's about practicing the little things, taking little leaps of faith, where, whether it's you know, go right instead of left when you're going to work or whether it's drive the car, or ride the bike, like these little moments where right. you're, something inside of you is saying, hey, maybe you should ride a bike today. You know, just listening to that. Mm-hmm. And once you do it enough times, in the little ways, then it'll start to accumulate and you'll be able to do it in bigger ways. Yeah, it, it really is about those little decisions, those little moments, having the awareness to be attuned to them when they occur so you can course correct. I mean, when I reflect back on my own life, like the huge changes that I've made are the product of small decisions or having enough awareness in a particular moment in time to know this is where I pivot this way. Mm -hmm. And those pivots are very slight. You know, Mm -hmm. when we think about things like inspiration and, you know, following your passion and all of these things, we think about sweeping grand gestures, but it doesn't really work like that. And I appreciated in the book, how you really, you know, were mindful of noting that it's not about that. It is mm-hmm. these little things and those little things will are, are things that I think are visited upon all of us. 100%. So it's really, a, it's really a function of how, how aware you are and that cultivating that awareness always goes back to these practices that you've been teaching and practicing yourself forever, the mindfulness and the meditation. Yeah, and it's not even just like, you know, 
things that light you up inside. It could be like, like on the way here to this interview, I was parked, my rental car was parked in Brentwood and somebody side swiped it and ripped the side view mirror off uh-huh. and all of these things. <laughs> you know, normally uh-huh. when you walk back to your car and you see that, you're like, shit. Now I have to like deal with all of whatever that entails, mm-hmm. right? But I tell a story in the book about being stuck in this traffic jam and on my way to teach yoga one morning and uh and it was like this phantom traffic jam in West Hollywood. It was at a time where there's never traffic on Fountain Avenue. So I'm like zigzagging around the Santa Monica Boulevard and trying to find a shortcut. And mm-hmm. cause I'm running late cause I didn't give myself enough time to account for a 15 minute traffic jam. End up showing up at class and uh, 10 minutes late. And then turns out right at the top of the hour when the class was supposed to start this wall mirror floor to ceiling wall mirror somehow dislodged and came crashing down right where I would have been sitting starting the yoga class. Uh-huh. So they were in there swipe, uh, sweeping up shards of mirror, broken mirror wow. on the floor and all the students were in the back of the room. And I was like, whoa, that traffic jam that, that just spontaneously m- appeared out of nowhere was actually saving you. me, potentially yeah. saving my life or saving me from having a very bad start to my day. And, uh, and so I, I learned from those kinds of experiences that even when someone sideswipes your car, you know, and it's, I didn't do anything. I wasn't like parked illegally or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I was just, it was a normal parking spot, but it's like, okay, well, evidently uh, my path is taking me in the direction of having to file a police report and all this. And who knows what's gonna come from that, right? So there's this almost, there's this sense of anticipation almost where, you have enough of these kinds of experiences and it's like, wow, it's almost like, because it's taking you off of your normal schedule, it's mm. almost like, okay, what's gonna happen? What kind of cool adventure? What kind of cool things yeah. are gonna happen This from is not these? happening to me, this is happening for, for me. me. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how or why, but that will be revealed in time. And if you can just shift your perspective in that way, it could allow you to find a little bit more presence and be a little bit more open to whatever those opportunities could potentially mm-hmm. be. So that's been my, my experience and and that's, you know, like getting rejected from that job in Paris. Like if I had been all sulking and not wanting to talk to anybody, I wouldn't have been open to the guy coming up to me, yeah. wanting to take me to the place where I was gonna get all of the apartments and everything else that I needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like you, it's almost like you can't judge a situation based on what whatever's happening. Yeah. You just have to go with that that flow of whatever it is, which sounds again, very simplistic, but it's It's very hard. It works. It's so hard to do. It is, you know, it is. Just to maintain neutrality. Yeah. Oh God, really? This is like interfering with my plan. Yep. That's why the book is called Knowing Where to Look. Cause it's like, even in those situations, the answers, the solutions are there if you know where to look for them, Mm -hmm. you know? So I want people to be able to use it for those purposes. When you're having a bad day for whatever reason, usually the bad day is a result of things not going your way, mm-hmm. right? If you know kind of, if I read that story about the mirror crashing, then it may allow you to release that, that negativity around the situation and just kind of like settle into it and be open to it. And, and, and you never know what's gonna happen after yeah. that. And that's what's exciting about life. Yeah, you mentioned, sul- you know, if you had been sulking after that initial interview. And I think that's a key thing because it's about the energy with which you carry yourself, like how you're reacting or responding is, you know, directly correlates into how you're being mm-hmm. with yourself and how you're being impacts how you're interacting with other people and how they're gonna react to you. You tell a story in the book about, um, how you engage with this flight attendant mm. and you go out of your way to like shower her with praise and thank her for her hard work. And it After must be being hard. angry that she was <laughs> yeah. bugging me. Right, like to take that contrary action and then to get this amazing result. And I think that's really powerful. And it, it, it reminds me of an experience that I had when we were in Minneapolis. So our kind of Sherpa, um, boots on the ground friend of mine who helped make this trip happen. And 
um, was a you know a really wonderful host to us when we were in town. His name is Brogan Graham. He's been on the podcast before. He's the founder of November Project. Have you ever met him? Do you know no, him? No, never met him. He's an extraordinary guy. One of the mo- I mean, there are extroverted people, and then there are Broganverted people. <laughs> this guy is so extroverted, it's like off the chain. And he has a practice of 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 not only carrying himself with just unbridled positivity and optimism and everything that he does such that it's become constitutional to him. But he makes a point of going out of his way when you're, I mean, you can't walk down the street without this guy going up to every single person and asking them how they're doing and engaging in them and saying, we're new friends and like exchanging phone numbers. Like it's exhausting, <laughs> but it's also, it's a really powerful lesson because all of these people leave those encounters feeling better yeah. because he's given them a little he's bit of love. He's funny, seen, he's a comedian, heard, yeah. he's like super you know, present and engaging. Um, and it was kind of a marvel to watch him do that. Yeah. And at one point, um, I think it was Jason asked him like, does anybody just like, you know, you know, shine you on. And while he's like all the time, he's like, it doesn't matter. He's like, it's, it's, it's just taking hits at bat. Like I'm just, you know, I'm getting more swings. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just, it's a practice. It's mm-hmm. a practice, I show up for it. And one of the other things that he does is rather than, and I've started incorporating this into my life as a result, rather than texting people or when you're in a text conversation, he sends people what he calls short films. Like he'll just make a video and you know he'll just talk extemporaneously about something and he'll tell a joke and he just sends that. There's no expectation that you have to get back to him. Mm-hmm. And there's such a difference when you get one of those, you feel much more connected to that person. Mm-hmm. And I've started doing that with some friends and it's been a really cool experience mm. of flipping that equation of like, oh, I'm too busy or I don't wanna text this person back or, or doing it to somebody you haven't talked to in a while. Mm-hmm. And they just get a little movie, you know, in their, in, their, in their messages app out of the blue. And it makes me feel better. And I just feel like it's a, it's a practice that I wanna continue to cultivate. And it's just an example of the story that you told with the yeah, flight no, attendant. hundred percent, man. And I tell people, you know, because people will hear that and go, oh, I'm not that kind of person. You know, I could never right. do that. But what's your version of that, mm-hmm. right? Like maybe it's a voice note. Maybe you draw something on your um, your your drawing app and you send, like if there's different ways, you can, maybe you sing a song, maybe you're different mm-hmm. ways for different people. If it resonates, if it, if it kind of like tingles something in your heart, then that's a sign that you should not ignore that you should find your way of doing that. And the only way to do that is to start doing it, Mm -hmm. not to overthink it, but just to start doing it in ways that make you uncomfortable. And then eventually you'll kind of hone in on what makes you comfortable. Well, the, the, the subtlety of it, the tingling can't be confused with the fear because it does require you to do, to do something different is by definition to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, if there's that tingling, it's gonna push up against a little bit of a fear response. 100%. And so like decoupling that or figuring out where you sit with all of that, I think is a very subtle art. Yeah, it's like when I first started writing these, these emails that ended up with culminating into this book, knowing where to look, you know, I had been receiving Seth Godin's emails forever. Mm-hmm. And then there was another friend, you probably know Jeff Kober, Mm, from the recovery community. He's oh, a meditation yeah, teacher, actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and he'd started writing these daily emails. And I was like, oh man, the, the, the thought to write a daily email just kept percolating. And then eventually I decided, okay, well, I need to take this thing seriously, but I'm, I'm gonna run out of content after like three yeah, weeks. It's like, scary. There's only so many stories that exist in the yeah. world. <laughs> And, uh, and I'd already written my book. So I'd already mm-hmm. like thought about a lot of stories for my first book, The Inner Gym, which we talked about on this podcast um, many years ago. And uh, so yeah, the fear was there and the fear was just as intimidating as the idea was inspiring. And, but again, you know, I just had to start. And sure enough, after two mm-hmm. or three weeks, I ran out of content, but then something really interesting happened that I would never have discovered had I not started, which is, from showing up every day, and Stephen Pressfield talks about this, this sort of muse-like creativity started to kind of come through me. 
And I was like, wow, I literally would be, you know, having to pr- hit the send button when 10 minutes and I had, I'd been sitting there for two hours trying to think of something mm-hmm. interesting to say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then in the final five minutes, it would like come through me mm-hmm. and I would write it down and you get this feeling, okay, this is it. And then you would send it out. And then the next day, same thing would happen. Maybe you have a little more time, but I just realized that if you keep showing up, you don't have to figure out what to do, you just have to make the space for it. It's kind yeah. of like that story I told about, I don't know if you remember the Moses story, but mm. um, it's one of my favorite stories in the book where it's a biblical story where, you know, we think about Moses as this kind of charismatic leader of the Hebrews. And, you know, he went and faced Pharaoh and all of these things. But the reality of that story, <laughs> according to historians was that Moses was a reluctant leader Right when he was at the burning bush and got the message from God to go to Pharaoh and let his people didn't demand it, let his people go. Yeah. So Moses hesitated. He was like he didn't want to do it because, as they have now identified, Moses had a speech impediment. Mm. So he was a stutterer. So this stutterer, who had never been in a leadership position in his life, is being told from quotes God to go to the most powerful, most dangerous person in the entire land and make a demand on his property. Right. Tell him to give him his property away. So you can imagine he, his first reaction is you, you got the wrong person. Right. You know? And God's like, no, no, you got the perfect person for uh-huh. this because you have to rise to the occasion. And so then Moses asks the most sensible question that anybody would ask in a situation like that, which is, let's suppose I were able to get in front of Pharaoh, if that's even possible, which is probably not, but let's just, let's just run this hypothetical out a little further what would I say? And God said, don't worry about that. Just mm. get in front of him mm-hmm. and then you'll know what to say at right. the time. <laughs> and yeah. that's kind of it, you know, that's the yeah, path. Yeah. Like yeah. we want the whole blueprint. It's like, no, 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 just take the first step. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened to me. I started writing these things. I didn't, I, I knew I was gonna run out of content. I didn't know what I was gonna say after that. And and, and I just had that message inside, Just just, write what you know now, and then you'll figure out what to say next. Right, yeah, you have this quote, something about, um, that's profound, something about how uh, the next steps aren't revealed until you take the first step. And yeah. I think we're all victims to one degree or another uh, of, of analysis paralysis. We wanna, we wanna know what the map looks like in its entirety before we even begin. And so we never get out of the starting gate. And I know this, all the things that I've, created started with taking a step and having no idea where it would head, but having on some level, some trust that if I take that step, that that next step will present itself and it's never failed me. And I think also, you know, the lesson in what you just shared is this idea that it's um, a witch's brew or this, this recipe between practicality and mysticism, like, the practical aspect of showing up every single day provides the space for the mystical unknown to enter, you know, and that's something Pressfield talks about all the time. Um, And there's also shades of of kind of 12 step recovery. Like when you get sober, the prospect of never drinking again is completely overwhelming. And you're continually told time and time again, you don't have to worry about that. You just have to hit the pillow tonight sober. You show up for the page. What's my daily email going to be today? I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm that I've committed to doing it every day. I just have to get this one thing done for today and trust that tomorrow, when I you know open up to the page, that something will inspire me. Yeah, it's a momentum game, hundred mm-hmm. percent. And that's how the, this podcast started. You know, we yeah. talked about it before on my podcast. Yeah. Uh, you went to that warehouse in Hawaii and just kind of. You know, let it rip. And there was no. I was like, "Am I going to do a second one? I don't know. Yeah. Like, this was fun. Yeah, let's see where it goes." But you learn, you know, about the sound. You learn, you wouldn't know what to even right. think about the sound until you actually mm-hmm. have echoey sound in the first. Yeah, few like episodes. I didn't know that. I probably shouldn't record this in a warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, how am I going to put these quote? You know, these these little monologues on Instagram with captions that yeah. look all fancy like these other people do. Well, yeah. I don't know. I guess I have to just film something first. And you know, there's this thing called the internet, and there mm-hmm. seems to be a lot of answers on that. To and help it's, me. yeah, it's not like you, you know, know the answers may come 
if you don't do the work. You actually have to do the work. That's the requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say, I love your quote, like the work is the shortcut. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. We're all looking for a way to avoid that, but yeah. the work is the means by which you find the answers to which you seek. Just committing to the, yeah. to taking those first steps is the short, that's the shortest route, mm -hmm. yeah. We'll be back in a sec, but first, if you dig this podcast, and I hope you dig this podcast, then I think you'll really enjoy my latest book, Voicing Change, featuring excerpts from poignant essays by and glorious photography of some 50 of my favorite guests over the last eight plus years of doing this thing, this podcast. It's a gorgeous, artful compendium of the show and copious wisdom shared therein, all wrapped in a hardcover coffee table form that provides a great taste of what we do here at the RRP and serves as a beautiful keepsake or gift for the ardent fan. The book is only and exclusively available on our website, signed copies are available and we are shipping globally direct to any coffee table on planet earth. So to learn more and snag your copy today, visit richroll.com slash VC. That's richroll.com slash VC. All right, let's get back into it. There is a sort of precarious aspect of, of stepping into this world of, of self-help and grappling with the ideas of curiosity and inspiration and motivation and discipline and purpose and passion and living your life in accordance with your values and self-actualization. Like these have all become commodified to one degree or another and also sort of diluted in what they actually mean. I think, the interplay between these types of words, you know, these words in general getting thrown around like fairly cavalierly uh, reminds me that I'm not really even sure we agree on what they, you know, they, they actually mean how they operate, how they interact with each other, let alone how to properly understand and leverage them to move your life in the direction of your aspirations. These are all themes and words and, topics that you are grappling with in the book. So I think it would be helpful and instructive to spend a little bit of time talking about that. I've got a, a story in the book about how I was in a yoga class one day and the teacher popped up into a, a headstand and he said, you know, the headstand is the most spiritual pose yeah. in yoga. And I was a yoga teacher You're at like, the time. Fuck off. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is he talking about? The headstand, how do you qualify? And then I realized, that his definition of spiritual was different from my definition of spiritual. Mm -hmm. And that was a big aha for me. Cause then I realized that every time I get into these kind of confrontations with people, and this is important also in the race conversation, right? When you talk about racism or discrimination or whatever systemic, there people have different definitions almost all the time. Almost every relationship mm -hmm. fight is the result of people having a different understanding of what it means to feel safe or what it means to love someone, right? Somebody may think love is always being there no matter what. Someone else may think love is, is, is um, allowing someone to fully express independently and then coming together and sharing whatever fulfillment they have inside. Like there's different understandings of all of these really simple terms that we kind of take for granted. And mm -hmm. so again, <laughs> I'm not presenting myself as the big guru with all the answers to all these questions. What is self-actualization? What is what? I'm just saying, have a conversation mm -hmm. and talk about what your understanding of self-actualization or love is. And then we can contrast that with my, with my understanding. We can find where we, where we find the similarities and then we can move from there. Maybe the ultimate solution is we have to go to therapist and have that therapist mediate like our, mutual understanding of these things, because that's where you're gonna find unity. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if you wanna try to force your understanding onto me of whatever the term is, then that's where you're gonna get disunity and confrontation and what, what you know, you're gonna create an experience that you ultimately don't want to create in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. I think that's powerful. Um, when I think about how you think about these things, my sense is that uh, it begins, like if you're on this path towards 
greater fulfillment or greater purpose, a greater purpose-driven life on some level, that this journey is sparked initially by curiosity and the courage to follow that curiosity. That may morph into what we might commonly understand as, as, as inspiration or a sense of direction like a North Star. Um, and it's through that pursuit that passion is, or not passion, purpose is, is revealed. Mm-hmm. Is that a fair like characterization of kind of how you think about it? Yeah, and I would go further to suggest, cause I don't think anybody knows for a fact, um, but to suggest that for those people who don't identify with a purpose or don't think that they have found their purpose, I would suggest that it's almost like the fish and water thing. Like you, you, you're so deeply immersed and enmeshed mm-hmm. in your purpose. <laughs> Whatever you're doing is a part of that purpose that you can't really see it. And that's okay. Cause that's what's normally happening for most people. And if we start thinking about it too much, it can actually cause us to be a little clumsy with our normal, you know, living our normal life. But if you just keep following whatever you can sense as your heart, you know, a message from your heart. And this is where meditation and all those kind of practices mm-hmm. really come in handy because it helps you to discern between right. messages from the alcohol, from the pain body, from the trauma, from the stress. Or the scrolling. Or the scrolling versus a legitimate message from that still small voice of your inner guidance. Mm-hmm. And again, that takes practice. So I, t- I say, start with the little things, find the courage with the little things, right? Even if it's, if your heart's saying, you know, have a salad today instead of fried, whatever, you know, follow with that one little mm-hmm. time, just, just, just to reinforce it. And every time we do that, it gets stronger and stronger. There's no way to shortcut this process. You have to like start listening to it in order to strengthen it and allow it to, to turn the volume up. And then once yeah. you, the volume turns up, then it becomes a lot easier to, to take those leaps. But that takes time. So takes time. patience is a requisite in all of this. And I think, you know, baked into that is an appreciation for the slow evolution of these kinds of things and an appreciation for the fact that it is about small gestures that aggregate over time. And it's Mm -hmm. difficult in our culture where we're so prone to fall in love with the overnight success or, or, you know, we, we have this fantasy of that or, in our scrolling, we see, oh, you gotta quit your job and here's how I made a million dollars. And you, you know, like there's all these narratives out there that I think make a lot of people feel either shame or guilt or, or um, inadequate because their lives aren't measuring up to this, you know, fantasy version of whoever is, you know, spinning some yarn in a short video or in a post on social media. That's why I love memorial services and funerals, as sad as they are, you get reminded of what's truly important in life. You see everyone that all they talk about are the small gestures, Mm. you know? So at the end of the day, no matter who you are, no matter how many accomplishments you have, no matter how much money you've acquired or titles or whatever, what people are going to talk about from your life are those small moments where you you allow people, you help people feel seen and heard, you stop, you went out of your way for five minutes here and there. That's what people remember. Yeah, that tropey know? thing of, of uh, it's not what you do, it's how you how you make people feel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, and it's it sounds cliche because it's true. And I think we need to be reminded of that as often as possible because the social conditioning, no matter how much we un- intellectually understand that making more money is not gonna make me happier, right? There's we all still, seem to still think that we're gonna find an end run around that one. Yeah, and, and we still make choices based on that, on that hypothesis, mm-hmm. mostly subconsciously, because that's the society we, we, we've, been, we've grown up in, this sort of casino capitalist society of zero sum, you know, I need to make as much as possible because no one's gonna look out for me and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And that's, I'm not anti, Capitalist. I'm not anti-profit. I'm not anti-success. That's what. That's not what my message is. I'm pro following your heart while you're doing all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. You know. And if you can, if you can put as much focus and attention on, on 
following your inner guidance, what you're gonna find in my own experience, what you're gonna find is you become more fulfilled as a person. And then that inner fulfillment starts to drive the agenda. You start to take jobs, you start to engage in relationships and friendships based on what you feel inside, right? Which is I'm already complete. So I'm just doing this because this is a great outlet for the fulfillment that mm-hmm. I, I, I can tangibly access inside. And it changes the why, it changes why you do the things you do, right? It's not to get happy, it's because you're already fulfilled inside. And again, when I'm talking about these terms, fulfillment and happiness, I'm not talking about binary terms. I'm talking about spec on a spectrum, right? Somebody may be at a five on a scale of 10 to fulfillment. Someone else may be on a seven, someone else may be on a nine, right? And so wherever we fall on that spectrum, that will determine the extent to which we can make those mm-hmm. kinds of more powerful, expansive choices, right? So if you only, if you're at a five, then that means maybe half the time you can make that courageous choice and the other half of the time you succumb to the fear. Mm -hmm. So really the game is how do I raise my baseline level of happiness or fulfillment, right? And again, that's where I loop back around. And I talk about this a lot in the book, back to meditation. Like you can't ignore that sort of foundational inner work that, and it doesn't have to be seated eyes closed meditation. It could be journaling, could be gratitude exercises, could be volunteering. Like some kind of inner work is almost required well, we'll take the almost out of it. It's required mm-hmm. in order to raise that baseline level. You can't ignore that and be happy at the same time. That's mm-hmm. that's that's the premise by which I'm presenting all of these stories. Yeah. People don't want to hear that. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you drink just give this, me the good stuff. Drink this sugar drink well, and you're good. It's happy. just like, yeah, just give me the thing that's gonna <laughs> give me the thing that I want. Like I get all that, that's fine. Or uh, you don't understand my life. Like I'm working two jobs. I got kids. Right. I'm just, you know, like that just sounds, that sounds cool. I'm happy for you light, right. but I'm already, you know, tapped to the gills. And so I guess in the next life, right? So how do you communicate with somebody who feels trapped in that way, in a, in a very real way? Yeah, I mean, well, look in the, in the recovery community, what do they say? Sometimes you gotta hit rock bottom in order to appreciate making different choices. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and unfortunately, and maybe fortunately, a lot of people are on that path, right? And the path is the path. Like it's, you know, nobody wants to go see a movie where the protagonist only has great things happen to them and then the movie ends. <laughs> you wanna see the <laughs> yeah. full trajectory. Uh-huh. You wanna see the low moment. You wanna see the rock bottom. You wanna see the self doubt. You wanna see the redemption. And so we're all kind of in our own version of that hero's journey. And so no one, you can't go wrong. That's the great news about it, right? Whatever your belief is about what I'm saying or about what you've read somewhere that you've dismissed, you can't go wrong. That's a part of the story. And that's what's so great about it, Mm -hmm. you know? Whether it's a traffic jam or um, someone sideswipes your car, someone, you know, gets sick, like that's a part of your story. And all I'm saying is if you can be open to the fact that there's some opportunity there whatever it is, then it will gift you with some insight that you would not have had otherwise that could help you bring about the things that you feel are, you're, you're being blocked from. Because mm-hmm. if you're in that situation where you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't have any time to think or space to think about any of these kinds of really highfalutin, you know, self-actualization concepts, then it's, it's usually, you, you, you see your job or you see your family situation as the obstacle. And as, as our friend Ryan Holiday says, you know, the obstacle yeah. is the way, that but you have, to, you have to be open to that as a possibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I just wanna help people look at that differently. That's right. all. The other, the other big stumbling block, and you've spoken about this quite a bit, is is the inner critic. Mm-hmm. You know that that keeps people from even getting out of the gate, or or even contemplating the possibility that change is available. Yeah, and look, I don't want to sugarcoat any of this. That that's a really that's a real thing. Your yeah. inner critic is a real thing, and what I'm doing is I'm showing you that it didn't come out of nowhere. 
like their inner critic develops and gets cultivated over many, many years and many instances of reinforcing that belief. And so in order to really overcome it properly, we have to do the opposite. We have to reinforce a different type of belief. And if we have enough empirical evidence, enough experience for ourselves that you know there's some light at the end of this tunnel, then if we keep moving in that direction, then eventually we will be able to contend with the, the fear and the inner critic and all those other yeah. things that are kind of stopping us from accessing our, our full potential. And so I just, I, you know, that's the whole idea of these stories is just to kind of chip away at the critic and all those other inner voices that I, we all have inside of us. Mm-hmm. Like I have them, you have them, whoever's listening to this has them. The only difference in someone who seems to be on their path and someone who feels like lost is that it's not that that person is less busy or less fearful or any of those things. It's just that that person has usually challenged those small moments where the inner voice seems to be driving the agenda mm-hmm. and they've experimented with a different choice long enough mm-hmm. and held on the in there long enough for some new insight to take shape. Sure, and that requires awareness plus courage, but developing those always goes back to getting quiet, right? There's no end run around, around this inner work <laughs> because if you're not consciously aware of how you're operating in the world and responding to the signals and the stimuli that are getting thrown at you, then you're incapable of seeing the broader patterns that continue to play out in your life that then you know, prevents you from being able to create that new narrative to understand when it's the critic that's creeping up or the fear response so that you can make a conscious choice to behave in contradiction to that. Yeah. And I would give your audience credit. I'm sure no one listen. I mean, you know, there are very few people listening to this particular podcast who aren't at least a little bit open to, to that that different sort of of path, mm-hmm. just from your own personal story, you know, and transformation. And so, yeah, it starts with awareness, and and that's that's all I want to do is help people become aware. I don't have. I don't have everyone's, you know, one, there's no one size fits mm-hmm. all solution to any of it. Um, but we do have to be at least aware that there are some inconsistencies in what's happening to me and the way I feel about it in life. Yeah. And if that can find more sy- symmetry or synergy within that, at least mentally, right? Starting just mentally, like shifting, like I really had to work to shift my, when I first saw my, my rental car sideswiped. I really had to, sh- cause I didn't get the insurance. Mm-hmm. Oh no. <laughs> my on. credit card should cover it, but <laughs> you know, it takes, I have to literally, I have to work on that, you know? Yeah. And, and um, that'll throw anyone off their game. Yeah, exactly. And it ends up ruining your whole day. But then if that happens, what are you missing out on? If you let that, something like that ruin your whole, the rest mm-hmm. of your day or week or what you? Yeah. How are you so easily relinquishing your power? Yeah to some external But event. it's easy to do if that's, if you have a sure. string of those, if, you have, of if you're dealing with racism and then you're dealing with yeah. a boss that's like, you know, not understanding you or it's, it's incompetent. And then you're dealing with something like that. And that was the And the if whole you idea. can't pay it and, or if you do pay yeah, it, then you you're not gonna money. be able to pay your rent. Exactly. You know, it, these are like cascading things that that's right. create a lot of chaos. That's, that's what I, we talked about with the inner gym, which mm-hmm. is like building up the inner muscles to be able to to contend with that. Otherwise it feels like running an ultra marathon. You've never yeah. even ran around the block before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really true. Um, and again, these things are subtle, they're whispers. And if you don't have that quietude or you haven't cultivated or finally attuned your awareness and you're just ping-ponging through life, reacting impulsively to everything that's getting thrown at you, you're gonna, you're gonna miss the miracle, mm-hmm. right? Is essentially what you're saying. And you have, you know, it, within many of the stories throughout the book, there are examples of little gestures that end up being very meaningful in a way that you wouldn't suspect from, you know, the kid who was gonna jump off the bridge and has a brief encounter with a stranger that literally, you know, unbeknownst to the stranger, you know, altered this person's life. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, it's, it is things like that that are the most meaningful. You know, you told the story of Moses. We all want God to talk to us directly <laughs> and tell us what to do. And it just doesn't work like that. Or, or God is talking to us all the time mm-hmm. from within. And, you know, we're, we're reacting like Moses initially reacted. But, you know, what happens if we do the opposite? Mm. Kind of like the Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld story of, you know, that episode when George Costanza complains that his life is just in shambles and, Jerry's, Jerry, and, 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 and Jerry says, why don't you just do the opposite of everything you've yeah. been doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he does the opposite and his life turns out to be, you know, wilder than his imagination right. ever right, was. Right, right. And, uh, and so, you know, that, those kinds of, of lessons, I think we just need to hear over and over and over in as many different ways as possible, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, contrary action. Yeah. That's what you hear time and time again in 12 step. It's like, well, my impulse is to react in this way. And it's like, what happens if you do the opposite? Because we already know what happens when you do it that way. You've got a lifetime of that and it doesn't play out well. So why don't you try this? It's like, oh, that doesn't feel right at all. Yeah, well, it's a muscle. Yeah. And the cognitive dissonance is so strong, you know? Like I was talking to a friend of mine today who came up with this sort of, what I can thought was a harebrained idea. <laughs> Um, but he had already convinced himself that this is what he needed to do. And, you know, I've gotten better because I'm not perfect. I've gotten better at just saying, okay, let's, let's, mm. let's see what happens in that situation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people have to kind of run their own research and experiments. And um, with the understanding that you, again, you can't go wrong because even if you, arrive at a destination that isn't what you ultimately wanted. It's you now you know, you have another, you have more evidence that this is not the way, mm-hmm. right? And it yeah. may take accumulating, <laughs> you know, all this evidence in order to finally be open to this other way. So that's why I say you're already on your path and, uh, and your path may have to take you through these these uh, right. twists and turns. Right. The the universe is always knocking, and those knocks are are you know kind of guardrails that are set up, and you you bang up against them, and those are little light knocks, like hey maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. But if you continue to ignore those signals, in my experience, the universe starts knocking louder mm. and louder and louder until some cataclysmic event occurs that finally gets your attention. And it's only in retrospect that you realize like, oh, you know, it it was trying to tell me all along, like I could have gotten off this train way back there and spared myself all of this pain, but it takes what it takes. Pain is a great motivator. And when the pain of your circumstances exceeds the fear of getting out of your comfort zone and trying something different, that's the, the space where real change can occur. And that's the power of not numbing yourself, not numbing the pain. The pain is useful in that way because mm-hmm. it can help you make different choices. Whereas if you numb the pain, you tend, to, you tend to make the same choices. Which is at odds with all the cultural signaling that we yeah. have, which is that we should be pain-free all yeah. the time. Yeah. We should always be happy. If you're not feeling that way, there's something wrong with you. Here's a, here's a medication. Yeah, so, you know. We have a lot of work to do, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> How has, you know, as somebody who's been practicing and teaching meditation for so long, um, how has it evolved? Like, what is your perspective on it now since the last time we spoke? Particularly I'm, in terms of, of like this, you know, r- r- you know, rather unique year that we've all experienced. Yeah, I think this was the, the pop quiz, you know, mm. like we got the lesson, <laughs> yeah. you should be meditating, you should be doing your inner work. And for those of us who kind of took that seriously, I think this year was an opportunity to really go deeper into that. And for those of us who kind of, you know, didn't study for the for the test, mm-hmm. it was uh, it was like just like it was in school. Like you felt overwhelmed, you felt unsure of yourself, but you you made a point to to go back and you know take a peek. <laughs> <laughs> the mm-hmm. lesson, because you know the test is going to be repeated again and again and again until we get it. So, on one hand, I think that um, you know, again, like all quote unquote bad situations, there's some value and opportunity in even in the pandemic, and um, and if hopefully you were able to 
to find something within yourself that you could help to improve or to build or, you know, or to work on mm -hmm. and or help someone else. If you're already feeling complete, then you are able to use that as an opportunity to help other people, mm -hmm. right? There's always an op, and I really do feel like ultimately our life must be about service in some capacity. Yeah. And so, you know, whether we're serving ourselves, self-care, whether we're helping others, whether we're helping our community, we have to make that a part of the daily agenda, not just mm -hmm. how can I you know, invest in more crypto for the sake of making more money so that I can be more comfortable. Like the whole comfortable approach to happiness is really backward in my opinion. And it really needs to be about how can I use whatever I have to the highest advantage of the people who are within my circle of influence, which everyone has somebody who's in their circle of influence. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that could be through writing, could be through speaking, could be through posting, could be through, you know, whatever means speaks to you the loudest at this moment in time. But I think that's what those kinds of opportunities are for. And it also exposes where we are living our lives most unsustainably and, and feeling and, and perpetuating a sense of disconnection and disunity with one another. So, you know, there's some, there's some opportunities within that as well as a society. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm glad that that's become a part of the conversation. What you said makes me feel hopeful. Uh, but then I look at what's going on. I see the divisiveness, I mm -hmm. see the pain, I see very real suffering. A lot of people who are, are, are struggling in, in meaningful ways with the challenges that you know, they've been presented with. How do you grapple with, you know, are you, what is your perspective on humanity's ability to emerge out of this situation or just in general to thrive in, in a new and different way? Yeah, we're in phase one. You know, mm -hmm. like if I came in here for this interview and I was like, Rich, you know, you did X, Y, and Z to me. And you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't do anything. I don't even, you know, yeah. I don't know you like that. And that's those kinds of conversations are happening with people where, you know, you have one group of people who are feeling accused of something that they don't feel that they are directly responsible for. Mm -hmm. You have another group of people who feel victimized or feel abused. And so they're going through the stages of grief and so that's going to create contention, you know, in the in the middle. And you'd have to we have to move through that. Mm -hmm. it, it happens with everything. It happened with me too. Right? It happens with all these different movements where we kind of go in these extreme ways in the beginning, but then eventually we kind of come back to the middle and we try to find unity in the middle. And uh and I think it's a reminder that we're a lot more human than we probably imagine ourselves to be. All of us are, which is a good thing too, mm -hmm. you know, cause we're, I mean, we pulled the lens back further. We're just animals. We're animals who can think about the future and the past more than say a monkey or a dog or whatever can. And we can organize uh, a lot, a little bit better than most other animals. We're not, I, I mean, it's still an argument of whether we're the most intelligent creatures Right. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way we treat each other, that comes in a serious question yeah. compared to whales and dolphins and you know things like that. So, um, I think this is a great first step. At least we're talking about it because before this, you had a whole segment of the population who were feeling abused, and there was no one to talk to about it except for themselves. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about it, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe by phase four or five you'll start to see a lot more unity in these conversations instead of a lot of defensiveness. Yeah, I mean, the manner in which change occurs, transpires is, is super interesting. These changes always end up happening in the middle through conversations of people slowly coming together and trying to identify what they actually agree on and concessions are made and all the like, but the movements in themselves are usually catalyzed by people who, don't want any, have no interest in the middle. Like they, you know, it, it's it's through a very loud voice that's taking, a, you know, a very intense stand on a particular issue that tends to garner people's attention and create the conversation in the first place. So it's almost like you need you need those voices. You need people who can do that, are willing to do that, and then you need 
the negotiators and the, the, the people in the middle as well. Like, I think it's like all voices are required. Also, if you look at Hollywood, if you look at just media in general, right? And this is, I don't know this for a fact, but I'll just guesstimate that maybe 90% of the stories that are told are pretty much all about white people in every conceivable mm-hmm. situation. White people in space, white people in the future, white people in the past, white people, <laughs> you know, yeah. doing all these things. That's the lens on everything. Yeah, so that's, how, so naturally it, it, it breeds empathy for people, white people in different situations, but there are not that many stories about this, the so-called other, about brown people in all in space. No one's seen a movie about some black person on Neptune, you know, mm-hmm. fighting with Matt Damon or something like right. that. Um, and so there's not, it's harder to relate to these other people. If, you're, if your story is being told in every which way possible, and then these other people are saying, well, I'm just like you. And it's like, well, you know, okay. But I think what's happening now, which is great, is that Hollywood is telling more stories of other people. Mm -hmm. And the more we hear those songs, the more we see those movies and television shows and narratives, the more people will start to relate to these brown brown and black people in all these different situations. And I think think probably that is gonna bring us closer together faster than just Telling someone, "Hey, I'm like you, and mm-hmm. I have these. I'm human, just like you. I have these, these dreams, just like you." And then having them kind of use their imagination. You have, we have to. We're a society. We have to actually see it. We have to feel the empathy in that situation, and 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 then we we kind of embody it yeah. in our life. And I, think I know you did a uh, you did a podcast with Ava DuVernay. Did you? Is that something that you talked about with her? I haven't listened to that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, she talked about, um, she's got this initiative called Array where she is bringing more uh, brown and black people to the crews of these films. Mm -hmm. So she's Mm -hmm. actually really passionate because she's obviously a director and she's done some wonderful work in documentaries and film. And, but in, in most of Hollywood productions, even if it's a black movie, the people behind the scenes are not mostly Black, yeah, and that can make a difference as well in the way that black people are filmed. Like literally, the director of photography may use different filters to bring out mm. the beauty and and, mm-hmm. and all of the the nuances of people with darker skin. And those kinds of considerations aren't usually made in in the executive suites of these studios. So the more diversity, and that's that's a big conversation now as well, is the more diversity you have in the boardroom and the C-suite in the production, the more valuable the product, the end result becomes because it's really speaking to more people. So yeah. you're, you're able to do more of what you already wanna do, usually which is make money and have influence and have impact. You're able to do more of that by, bring, by being more inclusive. So that was kind of her her general message. Yeah, and you're creating uh, model, role models within those communities that um, that lead to other you know, little kids employment. wanting yeah, to dream kid, yeah, to be a like, DP yeah, exactly, or, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. or director, exactly. Yeah, that's cool. And her story is awesome, man, because she didn't start directing. Didn't she was like a publicist, she was, right? She was a publicist. Yeah. She had a very successful publishing publicist firm, a PR firm. And then when she was 32, she was on the set of collateral with Tom Hanks, uh, Tom Cruise and um, Jamie Foxx. And she said, you know, I could do this. Michael Mann was directing, Mm -hmm. I could do this. And she started in her off time and her weekends, holidays, she started making these little short films. And then that cascaded into her making a first feature. All curiosity leading to tiny actions. She took the leap of faith, exactly. But it started really small for her. And she was almost, she was like uniquely qualified to do the kind of work that she was doing. And that's, just kind of going back to our original message is that's what I'm telling people is that you have some unique qualifications that only you can do and no one else in the world can do, but you have to follow the inner blueprint mm-hmm. in order to to um, to unveil them for the world, mm-hmm. right? It's our, the, 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 it's like Ikea instructions. Like it looks confusing when you <laughs> first look at it, but if you just take it step by step by step and it all kind of comes together and only you can do it. But it, But the difference would be, 
when you get the IKEA instructions, all the instructions are there. Yeah. So you could read through them all the way to the end. But in this case, you just get one instruction and yeah, you're told to trust time. that the next one, when you complete <laughs> it, there will be another one. Right. And it may not, <laughs> you may get it underneath the toilet or you may get it and on it the roof. And it might be in Swedish. It might be in Swedish. You won't be able to read it. Yeah. But you have to go yeah. to an interpreter and that interpreter ends up being your fiance because, you know, you have a connection and it's like, Everything is it's so beautiful. It's almost like a beautiful it's a sympathy. Game. Sim, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a beautiful little game that all kind of comes together, puzzle. Right. Um, but when you look back at the end of life, and that's what I love about what Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. Mm-hmm. When you look back at the end of life, everything kind of- It's crazy how that works. And the older I get- Everything connects. It's, and I reflect back and I'm like, it all makes sense. Yeah. And, when you're in it, it's utterly confusing and baffling. Yeah. And it makes no sense. And you think you're the only one who's confused, but mm-hmm. when you get older, you realize everybody's confused. Right. Nobody knows what they're doing. You know? <laughs> Nobody. And that's another Nobody. great thing about the pandemic is it exposed the fact that even at the highest levels of government, Nobody knew what they were doing. I know. You know, we're all just so basically disappointing. You're a kid, you just think like the adults, they know what they're doing, they're in control, they got no. it covered. I was talking to my daughter the other day and I was like, cause she's, she's 17 now. And I was like, it must be so disappointing to come in when you first realize like adults don't know shit. <laughs> she was <laughs> laughing, you know, cause when you're 17, you think you know it, yeah. you think you know it all. Like I didn't hit on that part of it, but, <laughs> but you are developing an awareness that all these people that you thought had things managed, you know, there's a lot of fuck ups out there too. Mm-hmm. Right. And that mm-hmm. I think, fuels that adolescent or teenage, you know, sense that like you could do better, which is great because we need young people to feel that way. That gives them the energy to, you know, inherit culture and reshape it. hundred percent, man. And it, yeah, it's a beautiful system when you really step back and take a look at it. And, and everyone is necessary. Like mm-hmm. everyone's story counts, no matter what it is, right? Even if, you don't end up doing anything that you consider to be remarkable, right? But you somehow share your life experience with someone else that could trigger. I mean, a lot of these stories in this book are things I've heard from other people. Mm -hmm. Like the one, I don't know if you read the one about the bridge, the little note that was on the bridge in Vancouver. So I was on a, um, I was coming from uh, a wanderlust event where I was giving a talk in, in a Whistler and then, me and 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 uh, Gary Zukav. Do you know who he is? Uh-uh. He wrote the Seed of the Soul. It's like oh, wow. one of my favorite spiritual books from back in the day. And he and I ended up being on the same speaking panel. I was so excited because I got to spend a lot of quality time with him. And then he and I were were assigned to the same van to go back to the Vancouver airport. So we're in this van, and our flights are both at around the same time. And there's all this traffic, this unexpected traffic going over the Lions, I think it's called the Lions Gate Bridge or something mm. in Vancouver. And it looks like we're gonna miss our flight. So that's in the, in the conversation and in the atmosphere, you know, there's this little tension with these people who are like these spiritual people yeah. and whatnot. And we're just kind of inching along. We get to the very peak of the bridge and I'm in the back seat and I'm just kind of like, you know, just kind of glancing around and looking and I'm kind of feeling I'm, I'm working the math on all the things I'm gonna miss because I'm gonna miss this flight because I have another appointment and I have to, you know, rental car reservation, all this stuff. And I just glance over and then on the side of the bridge is this little, it looks like a little note card that's like taped very sloppily on the bridge. And this is handwritten things scribbled on there. And I don't have the best eyesight. I can see well enough to like get by, but mm-hmm. I got prescribed glasses when I was eight years old, never wore them because I didn't want to have to be dependent on them for the rest of my life. So no I see way. this- get out. So you just walk around not being able to see well when you could just wear glasses? I mean, I could see well enough. I could read signs uh-huh. and stuff, but I think sometimes it's a little blurry when I look at things closely. Anyway, I see this little message and I take my phone out because this is what I do when you can't see well, you take a picture of it and you enlarge it. Mm-hmm. And so I did that, took a picture of it and then put my phone back in. And later on, we, we barely, barely got to the airport. We barely um, made the flight. But when I was sitting at- What page the, are you on? This is page 104. When I was sitting at the gate, I pulled out my phone and I found that I was just, you know, hey, you just kill time. I'm looking through the camera roll. I almost forgot about that photo and I found it 
and you see it's it's actually on the right side, it's a really small thing. So you you have to pull it close to see it because mm-hmm. I wanted people to have that same effect. I'm going, to, I'm trying to <laughs> scroll with my fingers. Yeah, right, me too. It says the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And I didn't know it at the time, but that's an Eleanor Roosevelt quote. But I started thinking like, well, it's the story behind, like who put that there? Was it for someone who may potentially want to hmm. jump from the bridge? Was it for pass- cars? Like, was it for someone who was stuck in a traffic jam on their way back from Whistler to the airport who would take a picture of it and share it in their book and use this story to inspire people to make, make little gestures mm-hmm. of kindness like that? You know, it's like, it's a mystery box. Yeah. yeah, but it was just like, it was just like this beautiful moment that again, if I was like stuck in the misery of this potentially missed flight, I would not have had the space to capture that little thing. And whoever, whoever did it, I just, it's fascinating to me. Like they have no idea this is gonna be mm-hmm. in a book that will potentially last right, that's forever. Cra- yeah, that's crazy. That's like, you know, the butterfly that flaps its wings and, you know, changes the weather. 6,000 miles away. Yeah, it just, cause it's not even like graffiti that's gonna be there. No. It's temporal, right? It's, yeah. gonna, it's gonna rain and that'll wash away. But in the meantime, I suspect thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people drove across that bridge, never saw it. Never saw or it. Or if they saw it, it didn't register. You might be the only person. Maybe, that's what that I'm was saying. was impacted in any way by that, gesture that was there for reasons we'll never understand. And now it's in a book and now we're talking about it on a podcast. We're talking about it on one of the most yeah, popular it's, podcasts. It's crazy, you know, yeah, <laughs> but I think it's a, it is a lesson. It, goes, it all goes back to awareness, right? If you're, you know, it's that thing of, uh, you know, if you're bored, you're not paying attention because there's just all kinds of utterly fascinating and amazing things happening all around you. And there are certain people who are attuned to that frequency more than others. Um, you know, I have friends, writers, you know, I, I'm thinking of a couple people right off the top of my head who will share on Instagram stories. They're incredible storytellers and they can take the, the most in, insignificant, tiny little thing and tell the most amazing story about it. Mm-hmm. And it's always this powerful reminder that, that there is nothing there to is be no bored about if thing. you are paying attention, that's right. right? And that's a beautiful illustration of that very powerful concept. Yeah, yeah, there are no throwaway moments. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and what if all the billboards were replaced with messages like that? Yeah. What would, what would society look like? Yeah. But every, you know, the, the way I found out it was an Eleanor Roosevelt quote was because I told the story, I wrote a daily dose mm. inspiration email about it. And then someone replied and said, that's an Eleanor Roosevelt mm. quote. And you know, so it's like a communal effort. Like everyone, she's like that person got an opportunity to connect that dot. Right, right. And or it was Eleanor Roosevelt's ghost. Yeah, who it. knows what happened in that person's life and whoever yeah. else read it. And so it's, it's uh, and these, these are uh, curated from the, the ones who, the, the emails that got the most engagement, like the biggest, so these have already been focused. Right, the book is like a five year project. Yeah, of, it's an anthology of, of, right, of, of all of these emails. The greatest hits right. mm-hmm. of, the most impactful emails. Mm-hmm. So it's exciting to be able to share those with the world. Cause a lot of those just, that was one that just kind of came to me. You know, I was sitting on my couch at 11 o'clock at night. Right. And it's just like, what the hell am I gonna write about for tomorrow? <laughs> you're like, oh, this photo. It's like, oh yeah, exactly. Right. And it just, you know, and that's, that's, it's so. And you give energy to these things and then they grow and, and they evolve and become something else entirely. Yeah. And the way I'm measuring success is, someone hears that or someone hears this podcast and then they're out somewhere and they start to adopt this idea that there are no throwaway moments. Mm -hmm. And they see something that they capture or they do something meaningful with, you know, for their own lives. And um, and it just, there's a domino effect from that. You just never know where it's gonna go. But, you know, again, in hindsight, you can connect those dots and it's always, it always, it's like the, you know, the connect the dot books that we had when we were kids, like it always tells a beautiful, this beautiful image kind right. of appears that you never would have seen otherwise. And that's what's interesting to me about it. Do you, uh, do you know Jedediah Jenkins? The name sounds familiar. Why does it sound He's a familiar? wonderful writer. He's been on the podcast a couple of times. He's one of those people that can spin an incredible story out of a seemingly banal event. Mm-hmm. And he does it with unbelievable consistency. And it's what makes him such a wonderful writer. Like mm-hmm. he just has, 
he's touched in that way. Um, but he just did this thing recently where um, I think it, I can't remember exactly how it started, but he was hiking somewhere in Griffith Park and there are these caves that are in the canyon that are kind of off these trails. And he either found a box with a letter in it in there or he, and then that prompted him to then write a letter and put it in the box or he put a different, I can't remember exactly the details of it. I'm sure I'm getting it wrong, but essentially he ended up putting this like wooden box hidden in this cave and left a letter in it and encouraged people to try to find it and leave a letter there, like just say whatever you want. And it's, a, it's another, it's a similar analogous mm-hmm. kind of example of a social experiment in small gestures that actually are, are kind of meaningful mm. and profound. Mm. Yeah, I, I wanna look that up. Yeah. You know, another one of my inspirations is uh, Humans of New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Brandon impossible Stanton. to look at, look at those, mm-hmm. those uh, Instagram posts and not like Be moved get emotional, by, yeah. t- get teary eyed and just hearing people's just stories, you know, yeah. it's just all stories. Have you interviewed him before? No, I'd, I'd love to actually. I know he's done a couple podcasts, but he's definitely on the list of people that I'd always wanted to have on the show. Yeah. I think he'd be great. Yeah. But it's, it's I think there's a craving and, a, and such a hunger for real stories, that level of honesty and authenticity that only comes with somebody like Brandon who can engender the level of trust where people feel comfortable Mm -hmm. um, sharing on that level. And people know the difference between artifice or some kind of performative version of that and the very real thing. And when you see, these are just average people walking down the street, they're not trying to, you know, Gain followers or anything no. like that. They're just being honest about and everybody their experience, has a story. and there's a universality in that that yeah. we can all connect to, and that's what makes us feel closer to each other. And is a recipe, I think, you know, a curative recipe for so much of what ails us. And I think that's our true wealth. You know, our life experience really is our true wealth. If we, if we can relate to it in a way that kind of gets us out of our own head or our own misery and allows us to be able to share it to help somebody else see things a little differently, right? Cause I'm sure mm-hmm. anybody really could write this, uh, accumulate these stories just from their own life. Most of the stories in here are my personal experiences and they're not, you know, I wouldn't consider them to be any more profound than anyone else's experiences. I was just paying attention a little differently in the way that was unique to me because of my life experience. But someone else like Brandon or whoever, you know, has essentially done the same thing or helped other people do it. And the way that they curate their story is, 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 and again, Brandon talks about this, you know, took practice. He didn't just right. come off from the no, very first doing this one. For, for a very long time. Yeah, he learned how to ask people questions in a way that draws out the best parts of their story, Mm -hmm. the most impactful parts of their story. And that takes practice. You learn from podcasting, how to interview people in a way that draws out the best parts of the story. Um, Brandon, you know, I mean, it's it's another example. You know, certainly this isn't something that he whiteboarded and thought this is gonna be a great career path for me. (laughs) You know, he was following his curiosity. He could have never predicted that it would hit this cultural nerve and that people would be so interested in it. And now it's like this, huge thing. And when I look at your career, what you've written about in this book, I see somebody who is in this, in this sort of dance with the muse, who's in communion with curiosity and how that translates into actions that you take or decisions that you make. And it's a far cry from this more mainstream paradigm of like, what is your goal? Like, what's the vision? Like, what are you working towards? Like, wh- you know, where's this all headed? Like, like, what, you know, I don't really operate like that. And I do, you know, I'm ge- I guess on podcasts, I get asked that question. Like, what do you, where do you see yourself in five years? And I've, I've, I've caught myself like trying to answer in the way that I see other people answering it. And then I have to check myself because it's like, I don't, I, I honestly don't think about that at all. I'm literally just, what's the next cool thing that I could do that gets me excited to get out of bed? And I'm in a fortunate position where I have my needs met and I can entertain those kinds of ideas. Um, but I got to this point by doubling down on that as opposed to you know, being very you know, uh, 
tactical or you know planning out these things. Right. I mean, and you, twelve you, years this ago, this is how you're operating. You right? never would have imagined. No, that this conversation. And if I set this as a goal, I would have missed the mark by a thousand miles because yeah. I would have missed out on why it got here, which was because you know I just made the decision to do what interested me as opposed to what seemed to make sense, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, how, so I'm like throwing that back at you. And yeah, I'm the same. I mean, I, I've, I, again, just, I think the best thing I ever did in my life was following the guidance to quit my first real, quote unquote, real job when I was fresh out of college. That was like the best thing I ever did um, because I, I realized that what we've been taught by society about what you need to do is not the mm. real story. Cause that's where my adventure kind of, you know, that's how I opened the book is telling right. that story. And the reason why I did it, and I didn't have language for it at the time, but I just kind of looked around and it was a great job. It was a great agency. Everyone was really wonderful, beautiful, nice people, you know, no drama. I look forward to going there. Mm-hmm. I would be the first there to arrive and usually the last to leave. Um, but I, at the same time, I looked at the people who had achieved the most at that place. And I didn't really feel like anybody was fulfilled in the way that I ultimately saw myself wanting to be fulfilled. And so I, I said, okay, well, this is where this goes, you know? And, and that's, a, that's mm-hmm. a process that I've kind of applied to other things. If you are in a space with people and you're, you're thinking of investing your time into that, whatever that space is about, look at the people who've been there the longest, who've achieved the most and ask yourself, are they where you wanna be, where you see yourself being? And if so, then that's probably where your path Mm -hmm. is leading you. If not, then that's probably not your path. And it doesn't really matter what the external rewards of being in that space are. It's really about what you feel about them inside. And so we talked about this on the last podcast is that when I, many years later, when I came across my meditation teacher, Tom Knowles, mm-hmm. like he embodied, for me, he embodied that state of fulfillment that I had been looking for without realizing that that's what I was looking for. Right. And immediately I knew that's my, mm-hmm. that's the next milestone mm-hmm. is to learn this thing, to help other people in the way that I'm being helped. Cause it always came, it came back to service. That's how I kind of knew that that was really my path. And I didn't, there was no, there was no, um, this is 2000, Three, so there's no teacher trainings or anything like that. And I wrote about this in the book. So I just had to trust that it was gonna lead in that direction. I just yeah. kept coming back and showing up and helping out. And then eventually many years later, he invited me and some other of his protégés to go to India and train us to become teachers. And then that really set me off in a right. completely different direction from where I was before. But there was this trust that I had, that I had developed, um, that developed and I was very intentional about it. I remember being 29 years old in my kitchen in Harlem and saying to myself, I'm gonna follow my heart no matter what. And um, after watching a Chris Rock movie. <laughs> takes what it takes, man. No, that's, that story is where you talk about um, this idea of, of wiggle room. Like even mm. if you feel like you're on a good path for yourself, like not holding on too tightly to it and always making room to be malleable. To be inspired. Yeah, Yeah. so that you can be available for the magical opportunity of going to India, you know, in the case of your story. And it's not about, you know, because some people may look at the hear that and go, well, that's just you not committing to whatever you said you were gonna do, Mm -hmm. right? And and I would would refine that and say, what's really, your, your feeling about your path, whatever that is, whether you have language for it or not, is always mm-hmm. gonna be there. But the day-to-day plans may change about how you get there or what, what occupation or what family yeah. lifestyle choices you have to go through in order to get there. And so that's where you wanna be malleable and be open to inspiration, not in, the, not in questioning the ultimate goal or plan. You really can't go wrong if 
if you just keep following whatever you're sure, doing. Sure, but you, you also can't expect to be smiled upon by you know perhaps your your peers and your colleagues because no, it that takes will, you completely away yeah, from it, social proof. You're gonna look like a dilettante. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this guy just goes from one thing to the next. You can't yes. really like stick with anything. Did mm-hmm. you read uh, um, David Epstein's book, Range? No. So it's a very interesting kind of study of a variety of people who have excelled in, in different fields from science and education to athletics and art, et cetera. And it, it, it belies this sort of Malcolm Gladwell myth of the 10,000 hour rule mm. and demonstrates that there are those people, of course, the Tiger Woodses and people like that. But by and large, most people who are fully expressed and excelling at the highest level of their you know, specialized field are people who earlier in life did lots of different stuff and, mm-hmm. and were the people who just really couldn't commit to anything. And as a result, they develop this robustness of experience that back to that idea of in retrospect, you know, all the dots line up, make perfect sense with where they end up, mm-hmm. but they're people of, of varied interests and, and many different passions who, who develop that capacity early to be malleable and flexible to have that wiggle room. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's those people that we look at now as lazy dilettantes who you know, ultimately it's reframing that and saying, well, and you talk about this, like how do you suspend judgment in the book? Like maybe they're like, you know, we should look at this a little bit differently. Perhaps they're in their exploratory phase and they're gonna be magnificent and amazing and world changing and something that they finally latch onto later in life. Yeah, I, I, there is a story in there about how <laughs> I talk about leaving that first job for the reasons that I left. And, um, and then while I was writing, I remember the day I wrote that story, I was in an Airbnb, I think it was in London, living out of a backpack, didn't own anything, still don't own anything. Yeah. I've got a little money saved up, but I had less saved up at the time. And I was like, yeah, you know, compared to my peers, I don't really, I haven't succeeded. I haven't really mm-hmm. done anything, uh, you know, that led to material, the material success that we kind of aspire towards today, but I've never felt more fulfilled. And I realized that the true wealth is the fulfillment mm-hmm. inside, right? And that's, again, this is a living experiment. <laughs> yeah. And it's not that I'm like walking around beaming all the time because I feel fulfilled inside. That's not really what, what we're talking about. It's just, it's having us inner security that wherever you are is where you're supposed to be. And if that means you get challenged in certain ways, then that challenge is there for you to learn something new about yourself. And that that new thing that you learn is going to add to the feeling tone of fulfillment, right? And so and so that's that's the underlying message of this whole path is your path is not leading you to more success or more comfort, it's leading you to know yourself better and ultimately to know to feel your connection with other people. And that could be a very, very treacherous path at some points. It could be incredibly uncomfortable at other points. And um, but the happiness that people tend to look for outside in success is is much more temporal compared to what you can feel inside while you're going through all of those other moments and obstacles in life. Beautifully put, man. You really stuck the landing. (laughs) I'm like, it's not gonna get better than that. Like we should just end it right here. But there is one thing I wanna do before I let you go. Yeah. Um, And I think this is like, um, specific to anybody who who might be questioning the efficacy of <laughs> of meditation, this beautiful passage who from the book for and for those who are who are following along at home with their own copy uh, can find on page eighty. It's called "So Gullible." Mm. I love this man. Mm-hmm. I love this passage. So can I read it? Yeah, I'm going to read it. I love that. Um, so gullible. People think meditation makes you gullible, but it's actually stress that makes you gullible. Stress makes you crave French fries, cookies, and wine. Stress makes you come up with important sounding excuses about why you can't exercise. Stress makes you think the reason you're tossing and turning at night is because you don't have the right mattress. Stress keeps you locked in in codependent relationships with emotionally unavailable partners. Stress makes you say and do foolish things you have to apologize for later. Stress even makes you think you're incapable of meditating because your mind is too busy. 
Meanwhile, meditation makes you bold. Meditation makes it really hard to put up with someone else's BS. Meditation makes it almost impossible to remain at a dead end job or in a bad relationship. Meditation makes you stand up for others and follow your heart with no fallback plan. Meditation allows you to be guided by your intuition instead of your fear. Meditation helps you accept others and let go of the need to control. Meditation helps you sleep like a baby, even though you don't have it all figured out. While I'm reading that, you know where my head was the whole time? I'm like, why am I reading this? I should have asked Light to read this, you <laughs> idiot. It's his book. I loved hearing it though. It was such a nice experience for mm-hmm. me to hear someone else. Cause you know, it's like you live with this stuff and to hear someone else say it in their own words, it's like, it's a really beautiful experience for me. So thank you for, for gifting me this with that. This is your post-it note on the bridge. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, it's great, man. I love that. It just breaks it down into very practical brass tacks and removes all the excuses that we have. Yeah, and uh, and hopefully it helps other people who who come across this work just look at things or consider things a little differently, like meditation or whatever it is that they're questioning, mm-hmm. and find find the solution within their own life experience. Yeah, I, I think the book, you know beautifully written, all these stories, et cetera. They're all prompts. This mm. is just a, a, you know, a catalyst to get you to Ooh, reflect upon these ideas a little bit more. You're not saying, here's your, here's your listicle. Mm-hmm. This is how you're gonna solve this problem. It's like, maybe look at it this way and then you know, circle back to me in a year, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, congrats on the book. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Everybody should check it out immediately, knowing where to look with the wear upside down on the page Mm -hmm. to play a little optical trick on you. Little optical tricks play out throughout the book, um, available at your favorite independent bookstore and on Amazon, of course, and at lightwalkins.com. Anything else you wanna leave people with? Continue to follow your heart and take leaps of faith. And I believe in you. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. The world is a better place with you in it. I'm at your service. If there's anything I can do to help you or help advance your your work, I hope you'll reach out to me. Thank you, I will. Cool, peace, man. Come back and talk to me again. I will. For round four, right? Yep. This, is, this is our third one. This is the third one, yeah. All right, we'll do four soon. Yeah. Peace. Thanks. Lance, namaste. <laughs>